If you turn your attention, we're going to jump right in the Word to Acts chapter 20. I don't know if you've heard of a man named Eutychus. How many of you heard of Eutychus? Krista, have you heard of Eutychus? You don't want to want to kiss. That was good at 9 and it was good at 11 too. Okay. Verse number 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, still sitting in the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, did do not be alarmed, for his, there is life in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so he departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Today, I want to talk to you from this subject, breaking out of our comfort zones. You guys got real excited about that, huh? Breaking out of our comfort zones. Father, we thank you today for your word. I ask that you multiply the word in our hearts. We open our hearts to receive. We open our minds to receive, Lord. We know that you're going to do something amazing in the heart of your people today. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Amen. You can be seated today. For those of you who have dated or in the dating process, perhaps you're um, aware of this term that I'm about to use. Um, It's called the friend zone. Uh, How many have been in the friend zone? Too much shame to raise your hand. How many have put people in the friend zone? There you go. Tell the truth. Uh, Nothing wrong with being friendly. In fact, uh, before you get flirty, you got to be friendly. But there's a line that you cross where it goes from potential romantic relationship, potential future, to being a buddy or a friend or a confidant, someone who is safe. Being friendly is not bad. In fact, the Bible says the people that have friends, they show themselves friendly. And so if you don't have friends, it's not because people don't want to like you. It's just because you're not friendly. But people who have friends show themselves friendly. So friends are a good thing. Friend zone, not a good thing. My, uh, my son, my oldest son, when he was young, he started off calling me dada. And then he grew up a little bit and called me daddy. Such a beautiful age. Anybody at the daddy age. And then he became like a pre-pubescent teen, and he called me father. Then he became a teenager, and he called me buddy. And then he now tries to call me TJ. And I'm like, that's not going to fly. You're too comfortable. Come over to my house. Maybe you've had some guests over. Come on over to my house. Make yourself at home because we want you to be comfortable. But we don't want you to stay the night, and we don't want you to sit in our seat, and we don't want you to go through our fridge, and we don't want you to invite other people over and make them comfortable like it's your own house, and we don't want you to change the TV station because we want you to experience comfort, but we don't want you to get in the comfort zone. In the Holy, uh, in the Bible, in, in Christianity, some of you are here today, and you're in need of comfort. And we know that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And we know that God heals broken hearts. And we know that the Spirit of God has come to comfort. As a believer and a Christian, comfort is wonderful. But you know what's not wonderful? Is this place we call the comfort zone. Let me explain in Scripture as they entered in the first day of the week, a young man named Eutychus and Eutychus, Acts chapter 20, verse 8, it starts to describe the setting that uh, it was the third story that he walked up to. Paul is sharing the word. There's many people who are in the room, and they're excited about the room. And uh, as he goes in the room, they're breaking bread, and they're eating food and enjoying the Lord's Supper. And uh, I think once this young man goes into the room, um, 
he feels how uncomfortable community can be. And so he starts trying to find his way out of community. Now, he doesn't want to be excluded from it, so he stays in the room. But the Bible says they're breaking bread, so Eutychus goes and eats, and he fills his stomach. I want to pause to say this on a separate note. Uh, A lot of times when we want to get comfortable, we have this thing called comfort food. Gravy, sugar, donuts. Can I get a witness in this holy house right now? You know what I've never seen as comfort food? Like someone saying, hey, I'm going to go get some comfort food. I'm going to have some comfort broccoli today. This salad is going to be so comforting today. It's interesting that the thing that makes us most comfortable is usually the most unhealthy things for us. And we usually eat sugar rather than salad and call it comfort. We usually take in things that aren't actually good for us and make us pay later but we're comforted by what's unhealthy in different seasons of our life. And so he comes in this room. They're breaking bread. He has a full stomach. It's late at night. There's candles, and the candles are sending off fumes. And as we know, heat rises, and heat makes us tired. And so it's a hot room, and there's all these people, any introverts in the house. You just don't want to deal with people. You want to hear the message. You just don't want to deal with people. And so he starts to look for the most comfortable seat in the house, and he feels like the one is on the window ledge, where he has the experience of community without the engagement of community. He gets to experience what's happening on the outside, but still experience what's happening on the inside. He wants to be around fellowship, but he doesn't want the commitment of fellowship. This doesn't just apply to church. He's the kind of guy that wants to be around the ladies but doesn't want to commit to the lady. There you go. Got somebody right there, right? He enjoys spectating but not participating. And so he finds what seems to be the most comfortable place, a place in the room that's on the far side of the room so he has a way out. And some of you are like that too. When you walk into a room with people, you try to stand by the exit door because you don't know how safe it is in the middle of the room, so you want to be able to get out. And you want your options. I could be in or I could be out. So the Bible says that Paul was preaching on and on. And the kind of preaching he was doing in in the Greek, if you study it, he wasn't like at a pulpit preaching. He was having a conversation. And in this conversation, this young man is sitting in a comfortable place. It's tired. His stomach is, uh, it's hot. His stomach is full. And he begins to get very comfortable where he is. I do this strange thing at night. Uh, We turn on YouTube, and there's this lady. She prays over us, and and she starts quoting scripture, and she says, you will be comforted tonight by the Spirit of God. No spirit shall come to you that is evil. God shall protect you and guide your footsteps. No evil thought shall overtake you. And I'm like, (sighs) in the presence of the Lord. I use his word to comfort me and put me to sleep. And, 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 and so what happens is this young man disengages from the conversation. He wants to listen, but he wants to listen from afar. He's the kind of Christian that likes to come when the worship's over. At least 15 minutes so you don't have to hear the fast or the slow song. Or he's the kind of Christian that likes to leave 10 to 15 minutes before the service is over so he doesn't have to talk to anybody in the lobby or get signed up for anything. He's the kind of Christian. uh, I just want to preface this by saying I love our online audience. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for giving and sowing in this house. But he's the kind of Christian that watches online not because he's in another location, but because he wants to enjoy his French toast and church at the same time. And in case the message ain't good, he's going to go to Elevation Church where it's a little bit better that day and most days of the year. Eutychus is now engaged, but at the same time disengaging himself from the conversation that Paul is having. And he's using the word to now comfort him rather than to challenge him. And I want to say it again. God's word 
comforts us in hard times. God is a very present help in all the times of our trouble. But God's word is not just filled with comfort. God's word has challenge to it too. And when he's there, he's falling asleep because he's being comforted and disengaged with the community and with the word of God rather than letting the word of God challenge where he is. If you want to be loved on and cared for and comforted, you came to the right house. But can I encourage us in a comfort crisis culture where people don't want to be challenged, where people are offended by everything? Sometimes you're not living right, acting right, and doing right. And sometimes you just ain't right. And sometimes the word of God is meant to cut some things out of your life and to challenge where you are. There are some seasons where God's going to love you where you are and the word's going to grow you where you are. But there are some other seasons where God's word's going to challenge you and not agree with your man-made doctrines about his scripture. There are some things that start to challenge us. And most of us love comfort, but how much do you love challenge? Because what makes us comfortable usually makes us out of shape spiritually. And then we call a coach, and we don't ask him. We pay him not to make us comfortable, but to challenge us. Because we only grow in the face of challenge. And some people say, I want to grow. What you're praying for is more challenge in your life. James 1.22 said this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. That means when we hear the word of God, we become responsible to the word that we heard. Maybe it is good that the average Christian comes to church once every six weeks. That's a real statistic. Because every word you hear, you become responsible, lest you condemn your own soul. And so, if you come to church every six weeks to get discipled, I I wonder how often your children will come to church in the future. If you go to the church you tolerate, I wonder how much your children will resent the faith later. If you go to a church or you don't go to church because you've been wounded and offended over time by a church, but you refuse to let that thing get healed in you, I wonder what you'll pass on to the next generation until you say, Lord, I need you to heal the things in my heart. I'm not going to sit back and disengage. I'm not going to create space from what you've called me to or who you call me to be. I'm going to say, Lord, if your word challenges me, it's because you've given me the grace and empowered me to walk this thing out. Let the church of God (laughs) say amen. So we want to get out of our comfort zone where we create an environment where we're just consumers. The Bible said in Philippians that they made their stomach their God. They came in wanting to fulfill themselves. They came in and said, that message wasn't good today. We're not coming back. They came in and said, that song, I didn't enjoy that song. It was too redundant. They kept God's faithful, God's this, God's that. Same, Same lyrics for like 20 minutes. I'm not coming next week. Because they want it to fill their stomach. I feel the Holy Spirit challenging in us to say, I've saved you not to just be a spectator. I've saved you to be a participator in the house of the Lord. Number two, I want to talk about this comfort zone. This is the comfort zone of immaturity. The Bible says that Eutychus was sitting at a window a certain young man. Do you know young people can do some crazy things? There you go, testify. (laughs) Young people can do some stupid things. Y'all got quiet. How many remember you were young and you did some stupid things? But do you also know old people can do some stupid things? Older people can do some crazy things. The number changed, but the maturity didn't. 
And so it's easy for us to settle in to our immaturity. This young man comes into the room, probably after working all day, tired, and now he's burnt out, sitting on a ledge, and about to die because he makes decisions without thinking about the consequences. He goes into a room disconnected. He goes into a room tired. Can I tell you today, just to challenge you for a second, your rest is your responsibility. And if you get burnt out doing what you do, it's nobody's fault around you. Your rest is your responsibility. And we have to have the maturity enough to know that God's given us space and time to find rest, not only in him, but rest in our schedules. And so he, as a young man, walks in uh, unengaged with the room, not considering consequences. He seeks comfort, and he stays on the edge. I've seen this time and time again where people get offended, so they take a step back. Cultural things start happening, so they take a step back. They want to be in, but not all the way in. So they keep taking steps back. And then one day they say, I just don't feel connected here. You know why you don't feel connected? Because you're not connected. Because you disengaged. Because you sit at the edge. And this is not a message that's saying get in or out. This is a message that says get in, be safe, get in Christ, get in prayer, get in the things of God. There's no other alternative for your life. Get in to Jesus. The scripture says in Ephesians 4.14, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away with every wind of new teaching. We're not flakes. We will not be influenced when people try to kick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. Before I just get on to Eutychus and challenge Eutychus today, let me also talk to Paul and the other people in the room. Was there not somebody in the room that saw the young man sitting on the window who had the courage to say, hey, young man, you're sitting on a window, and I don't know if you know the consequences, but you might fall and you might die. Why don't you come sit with us? Why don't you come over here in a safer place? It is not love to not speak the truth. It is not love to watch your kids run in the highway. It is love to speak the truth in love and say, hey, I want to challenge you that maybe they told you this, but the word of God says this. It is not love to stay silent, but where's the generation that says you're sitting in a dangerous place? We have to be mature enough uh, to be to be led in that way, the level of our impact will rarely ever rise above the level of our maturity. And this is how we know that believers are maturing. When they know they've been saved from something, but they also know they've been saved for something. That God didn't just call you out, but God called you in. When our filter is not just based on us, but it's based on people around us as well. When we know we've been purchased, but we also know that we have a purpose. Our maturity is essential in our Christian walk. And none of us have arrived or probably ever will arrive, but we can grow up. And so here's, with all of our levels of immaturity, this is the big message for Zone 2. I want to encourage you today. Grow up. Just in in God's grace and in his love, grow up. You are offended about everything. Grow up. Oh, my kids, they don't respect me. Grow up. None of them kids respect us. My spouse said I'm looking a little chubby. Grow up. (laughs) Grow up in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. This is how immature we get. Today, um, I, I was waiting for my sugar-free Red Bull that I have every morning on Sundays because I know it's going to be a long day. It's a part of my anointing process. It's like anointing oil, but not the same thing. And so, uh, Miss Irma, every morning she brings in this sugar-free Red Bull on Sundays for me. And today I was waiting, and I didn't see Miss Irma come in with a sugar-free Red Bull. And so Juan... He shows up today, and he doesn't have a Red Bull in his hands. I'm like, hey, uh, you going to bring the sugar-free Red Bull? And he's like, 
oh, like you expect this to happen now. And I, I learned something through my own immaturity. The first time you get something, you get grateful for it. And then you assume the next time. And then you expect the next time. And then you become entitled the next time. And then you become dependent the next time. And now I'm walking around like somebody owes me a sugar-free Red Bull. When I used to be grateful for it, now I'm entitled to it. And don't act like you are, I'm the only one here today. Things that you used to be grateful for, you're now entitled to. You used to say thank you, but now you said about time. <laughs> Things that you used to praise God for, now you're dependent on people in areas that they never made a contract with you, and you have expectations that don't even exist because you quit living in gratitude and you let immaturity rule your life and heart. I said all that to say this, grow up. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of our God-given dis destiny. It undermines our progress. It hinders our relationships, and it prevents us from realizing our God-given purpose. This is what Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's many people who have many different experiences in this room, but we could all use some growing up. Amen. Number three, I'll close with this. Let's break out of zone number three, the apathy zone. The apathetic zone. The scripture said, in verse 9, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. As we all know, physical sleep is necessary. But spiritual sleep is is dangerous. Eutychus is not the only one who's fallen asleep in Scripture. In fact, you remember this spokesman at Pentecost, his name was Peter, who when in the garden was asked if he could tarry or stay awake for one more hour, but somehow in his frailty and weakness, he kept falling asleep. We see Peter write in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, and he says, stay awake. Be alert. Be sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking and looking for someone he may devour. Peter's saying stay awake not because he had success in the last season. He's saying stay awake because he had failure in the last season. And some people with their greatest messages, it doesn't come from their success. It comes from their failure. And he realizes I fell asleep, so I want to encourage you, stay awake. You have an enemy who wants to destroy your soul, who wants to destroy your family, who's after your purpose, and who's after your calling, and I want to encourage you, as Peter did, stay awake. The guy who fell asleep is the one who's teaching people to stay awake. The scripture said, but Paul went down fell on him, and embracing him, said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. Paul is giving this great sermon and conversation. And this young man falls out of three-story window, out of a third-story window, and dies. What a terrible sermon. You would definitely experience council culture these days. And so Paul stops the sermon and he comes down. You don't have to die this service. It's fine. We'll imagine it. And the Bible says, as the young man lay there, that he fell on him just like Elijah had did in Kings. And he embraced him. 
and he saw that there was still life in him. I want you to see this picture, and that's the only reason I walked down. I want you to see this picture. Until one generation is willing to come down, another generation will never come up. And until one generation is willing to humble themselves to come down, another generation will never rise up. Until one generation begins to see life in the next generation and just quit pointing out the death that they see and quit pointing out the failures, but say, I still see life in you. Until one generation quits making it about themselves and their egos and their kingdoms and says, I see life in the next generation. I see the enemy at work, but I also see the grace of God at work in the next generation. And everybody saw him as dead, but he said, I see life in him. Him. Maybe you haven't heard this today. Maybe you don't feel very alive, but can I tell you, under the power of the Holy Spirit, I see life in you. I see life in your children. I see calling on your children. I see anointing on your children. With a stizzy in his mouth, there's still life in him. Come on, Eutychus. Until one generation will come down, another generation will not rise. Until one generation quits tolerating their church, so the next generation will only resent their church. And Until one generation starts celebrating what God's doing in this generation rather than just discouraging everyone in this generation. Until one generation says there's more life in you, they'll only see more of death. This is the meaning of Eutychus's name. His name means fortunate. And, and I believe his whole life was meant for this moment where he falls and dies. He was in some unfortunate situations, but he was fortunate enough that somebody still believed that there was life in him. And I don't know if there's any Eutychus in the house today where you're just fortunate to be here because there was a season that you couldn't even be here. You're just fortunate that you were able to get remarried because there was a season you thought you'd be alone for the rest of your life. You're, you're fortunate that you got to praise God today because remember when you were in the hospital and couldn't praise God? You're fortunate because remember when you were in cell block, whatever number that was, but we don't want to talk about that right now, but you're here today. I don't know if there's anybody here that's fortunate that your life should have been gone, but God spared your life for one more moment, for such a time as this, to give him praise, to give him thanks. I don't know if there's anyone that can testify, I shouldn't be here today, but it's for God's goodness that he said there's still life in you, there's still purpose in you, there's still calling in you. Oh, Eutychus, I see life in you. I see life still in you until one generation comes down another generation never comes up he comes and he takes this young man and he brings him to the top uh, to, to the top floor again i love this because eutychus you know where he doesn't go he doesn't go back to the window he doesn't go back to the comfortable place but he comes back to the table Woo. He comes back to the fellowship. He comes back to sit with people, not apart from people. He says, you know what? If God has spared my life, my response to God's goodness is that I'm going to come back to the table. Can I tell you today, some of you think you're blessed because you're good. You're not blessed because you're good. You're blessed because God's good. Some of you haven't tithed in 10 years and you still got financially blessed. You know why? Not because you're good. You still owe God, but because God's good. I seen God bless even my enemies. I'm like, what? I thought we were supposed to blow up their tires, Lord. You didn't hear my prayer, did you? I said, make their car break down, not give them Mercedes Benz. What's your problem, God? But God blesses based off of his goodness, not our goodness. Doesn't God, it's not God's approval of our character just because he's given us blessing. He's blessing us based off of his goodness, not our goodness. So all of a sudden, we realize when we come in this house and we give and we worship and when we serve other people and we love our neighbors and when we reach people for Jesus Christ, 
We're not doing it just because of who we are. We're doing it because we see how good God is and we're responding to God's goodness. And he comes back in the room and he doesn't sit at the, at the seat. He's, he doesn't sit at the, the window. He sits at the table and he starts eating. And the Bible says that the next day they departed. He joins the mission. And then they, they, they say not, not one of them were a little comforted. They weren't comforted because they were challenged. They weren't comforted because they were challenged. And I just want to encourage some of you today that God, by his grace and mercy, has brought us from death to life to reposition us to see his goodness in new ways. And our response to him is not to sit on the outskirts as if we weren't sons and daughters of God, but to sit at the table the table of fellowship, the table of communion, the, the, the table that says, hey, welcome home. Would you stand to your feet today? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over each and every individual here today. As you challenge us, as you challenge us today, I pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I feel us being even convicted unto righteousness as the scripture teaches us.